we've been given a brief. Uh, the title is Living with our Gatsby, and I suppose that's the best place to begin. Uh, Sarah, you've written uh, an extremely well-received, extremely well-researched book on The Great Gatsby, so let's start with that. I mean, The, the Great Gatsby, the book, was both written and in and defines a particular age in American history. Uh, we call it the Gilded Age now. It, it was sort of symbolized by these excesses of wealth, these inequities of wealth. Uh, so could you take us through the characteristics of that decade, or maybe a little bit more than a decade, what led up to it, and what it was marked by? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the author of The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, was born at the height of the Gilded Age. He was born in 1896. And so he grew up in this era. This was the era in America of monopoly capitalism, of tycoons, and this new explosion of private wealth. And before that, there really hadn't been the, 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 the in fact, they, they talk at the time about the fact that a, um, there was this new concept, a multimillionaire, that you could even be a multimillionaire. And um, in fact, there were articles around 1900 that said that a multimillionaire was an un-American dream because, in, because it would lead to inequality by definition, because it reflected inequality by definition, that there was vast private wealth in the hands of a few people, and that would be undemocratic because it would mean that equality of opportunity was not available to everyone and that economic equality was not being spread properly, that collective well-being was not being looked after. And so that led to, um, and, and in fact, the, the metaphor that we all use of the 99% and the 1% was one they used as well 100 years ago. They said exactly the same problem. They said wealth is concentrated in the hands of 1% and 99% of the country risks being in want and not having enough. The debates are really, really similar. The echoes are really strong. And that was when Scott Fitzgerald was growing up. So in the 20s, when he wrote The Great Gatsby, as a, and he was a, a younger man than sometimes people realize. He was 28 when he wrote that book, which if you are a writer and you admire The Great Gatsby is the kind of fact that makes you want to tear out your hair, um, that anybody could do that at 28. Um, but he started thinking about it at like 26, right? So he was a young man and he was watching America in the 20s really come under the thrall of the pursuit of profit of the idea that wealth was the only thing that mattered and that these older values of democracy and equality were getting lost along the way. And he saw what he would have um, viewed as the American dream of larger aspirations of a society that wanted to do better, that could be not just bigger, but better. Um, and that there's a moral quality to what America was supposed to be. And he saw that being degraded and you know, drawn into the dirt by this kind of sordid chase after, after wealth and material well-being. And that's really what prompted him to write The Great Gatsby. It's a warning. It's a cautionary tale. He's saying, America, you're going in the wrong direction. And everybody ignored it. And we've continued to go in the same direction for 80 years while saying this is the best book ever. And we still don't actually pay any attention to its message. Sorry. <laughs> that, that, no, that's interesting. I mean, it's... Um we all, I mean, maybe because we've been conditioned by the last 80 years, but we tend to think of the American dream as the pursuit of profit, as a capitalist sort of ideal. Um, and it's interesting that you would say that in the 19th century, that was not actually the be all and end all of the American dream. Um, so what normalized, I mean, and maybe I ask you this about the, about the Gilded Age, but even the decades since then, what normalized this particular pursuit of profit, this pursuit of wealth as the American dream in the sense that we know it and see it today? Um, well, it's interesting you should ask that because after this book about The Great Gatsby, I've actually um, written another book about this, about the history of the American dream and how those ideas changed. And I've, it's, it's not a book that I intended to write, but um, I wrote it in response to Trump, actually, and to what's happening in America right now. And I've described it as the kind of accidental stepbrother of the Gatsby book, because they, so they sort of work as a pair. And, and in that book is where I really talk about that story, about the changes in the meaning of the American dream. The, the short answer is that it happened after the Second World War, and it really was a, a function of the Cold War. Um, that what happened was America started to conflate ideas of capitalism and ideas of democracy. And they started to see this idea that having won the war and then thinking that they were going to defeat the Soviet Union, 
that, that there was going to be this consumer capitalism that defined democracy, that defined liberal democracy and the good life, and that that would be what um, America could offer the world, and that would define prosperity and comfort and luxury, and that you'd win the Cold War with Frigidaires, you know, because you'd have the most modern appliances. And, um, and that idea that that would show the, that the Soviet Union, that Soviet communism had, had, you know, gotten it wrong because people were living, you know, um, in, you know, impossible conditions and there were queues for bread and things so that they didn't have the basics of, uh, of you know, material well-being, um, you know, sorted, right? I mean, they weren't getting that right was the, the kind of logic of it. And that, so there was this kind of this sense that they had that um, America was winning this moral victory, that this would show that America was morally superior because it had this comfort and because everybody was doing so well in the post-war boom. So this idea that capitalism was kind of inherent in ideas of American democracy started to gain hold. Um, but there was still pushback. And so there, you can see tension in the American political debates over, uh, over this question through the 60s, through the 70s in particular. But then it's really with Reagan. Um, and, then, and then, you know, all bets are off and um, it's all just about making money. And that's the point at which, you know, he, he says that America as a city on a hill, as this beacon for the world, is all about that kind of consumer capitalist vision of America. And it's only very recently, really since um, the Occupy movements, I would say, since around the 2008 crash, that, that a large number of Americans, particularly young Americans, are seriously re-examining those values. But for a good 50 years, they pretty much weren't. And I guess also with the fall of, of the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of communism, uh, it was easy to sort of believe that our ideology, the capitalist ideology, had won. You know, it was a battle between two ideologies, and one was decisively defeated. Um, and it's interesting that we uh, we come to sort of the late 80s and the early 90s as a as a watershed moment here, because for India, Shonali, that was a watershed moment for us, right? That was when the Indian economy opened up. Uh, that was when India itself decided that it was going to go down the path of market economics, uh, a more unbridled form of capitalism. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, I mean, since you have a particularly keen eye for, um, you know, the lives of people who might, who might be said to be the inhabitants of the Gilded Age in India today, uh, what kind of parallels do you see between that age and, and the India of today? What do you see as the symptoms of that kind of age today? So yeah, uh, it's absolutely the same, exactly uh, the way we've had the Rockefellers and uh, uh, Vanderbilt, right? Uh, it started with them being uh, first very, very low income and then becoming uh, what you call robber barons. And uh, then the successive generations who wanted uh, very badly to be accepted by the patrician classes uh, went on then to, you know, legitimize their wealth by first building palaces for themselves and then, you know, setting up institutions and social institutions. So I think that we are where the Vanderbilts in that era now in India. And uh, you see, historically, Indians have, because of the Mughals came, the British came, uh, our sense of scarcity is very deep-rooted. So uh, America was relatively a newer nation when the robber barons happened compared to us. But we've had people come and then plunder us and go back. And so, though the concept of dana in, in Hindus and uh, zakat in uh, Islam uh, ha was, was inherent to religion in India, which was being followed, Hinduism the way it was being practiced, and Islam later. But I think when colonization happened, and uh, a lot of these social institutions that were being funded by the Maharajas and the Rajas, uh, the British wanted, they felt that was misutilization of funds towards setting up these charitable homes and, uh, you know, for the invalids or for the ailing or even whatever degree of education they could manage, but then they diverted those funds towards their greater goals, as we all know. So I think after that, you, I, one finds that in India, even if the, the, the degree of wealth runs into thousands of crores, personal wealth, uh, the desire to save it for the next generation runs far, far deeper than an analysis of the deep-rooted selfish nature of this sort of a capitalistic attitude. And therefore, we are distorted by our inequalities right now. But then I also find that, you know, since we are talking about Gatsby, 
in terms of old wealth and new wealth, I think the newly wealthy or the Gatsby's of our age in India today are really no different from what the people who are perceived as old money were when they were starting out. Yeah, but I mean, could you make the argument, I mean, we talk about Gatsby, and of course there's this famous, uh, the construction of Gatsby as a resident by the lake out in West Egg, Long Island, you know, sort of having his mansion. And we have Lake Como in our title, we uh, know about uh, at least a couple of weddings by our own newly wealthy on the shores of Lake Como, the ostentation on display over there. There is one, at least one wedding in recent memory that was so ostentatious that we cannot forget it in all our Instagram and Twitter perusing and so on. Um, you know, so uh, I, I find that the, the, the ostentation part of it, you know, the old, since we're talking about old money versus new money, where does ostentation figure in there? I feel like uh, the... I, yeah, I, go, I got you. So the thing is, I think most of these billionaires that you're seeing now in India, and I think there are more than 100 on the Forbes list now, compared to, I believe, two in the 90s. So post-liberalization, the economic growth and boom primarily has happened over the last 15 years or so, right? In the 2000s, in the new millennium. And before that, we were, because we were uh, a closed economy, even if you had wealth, uh, you couldn't really buy a car better than a Fiat right? Uh, you didn't have access to symbols of wealth. Uh, and even if you could enjoy them outside of India, you had to, it seems, declare your money at the, uh, I'm traveling only with this amount of money. So you had to go live, live with relatives. You couldn't really enjoy it and flaunt your money over there. So I think that it's like when you give a child a new gizmo, a new toy, and the child is just really excited and he wants to skip school and just play with that. And not that it's a justification for what's going on. But I think that Indians are now thinking, oh my God, we've made so much money and we've never seen this kind of money and let's see how far we can go with it and what kind of a circus or a good life we can create with it. And also because a lot of these billionaires, about 60 to 60% of our billionaires today, 66% are, are people who have come up the hard way. So they feel it's our money, I have earned it, it's my son's wedding or my anybody's wedding. Let me hire Beyonce, yeah. Let, uh, whatever, I yeah. mean, you know. Uh, and so in this whole concept of a wedding in Venice, flying halwais from Lucknow for a wedding in Venice because all your guests are vegetarians, uh, hiring palaces uh, uh, in, in Belgium and uh, in Vienna, uh, calling Enrique Iglesias to perform. It's also somewhere there is a strange distorted national pride. You know, Indians have had that complex for far too long that we are have not. So even when we become haves, in our mind, we haven't made that transition. So we are, need that validation that, oh my God, we have arrived and we can pay you money and have you be a backup dancer, uh, is a sort of a putting a flag high up and say, come on, <laughs> look at us. If we, um, Kate, if we move from sort of the top of the, the hierarchy of wealth to the to the bottom, in a sense. Uh, you know, this, the kind of American dream that we've, uh, we've come upon now over the last 80 years, and particularly as it flourishes today, uh, how does it fare in sort of low-income communities, minority communities, the kind that you work with and write about on a regular basis in the US? Well, I, what I would say is that the communities that I work with um, in both the United States and in India have some things in common, and first, crucially, um, is, that, is that other people's affluence is in their face all the time. Um, this is not, you know, unlike in Mao's village where the peasant had no idea what the wealthy were doing. Um, people in slums know about that $100 million wedding. Um, people in housing projects, you want to go break your heart? In this world, you go into a housing project or a, a council flat during the summer or the school break in London in the United States and you watch what young people do and if they're lucky enough to have an internet connection, it's hour upon hour, day after day, looking at what other people have and what other people are doing that they're excluded from doing. Um, so that, that is a chief, a central um, reality of poor communities today. Um, the other thing that is, is um, two other things that are central um, housing is incredibly unstable in the communities where I work around the world. The environment itself seeds sickness. 
and people in those communities have very few defenses to protect them from the changes in the environment. And above all, I think um, work is incredibly unstable. You see in India, maybe 72% of jobs estimated recently are fragile. When you look at in the United States, 94% of the new jobs created in the last 10 years are of the impermanent um, alternative variety. And what you have is a situation where people feel that whatever they have, however little they have, it's extremely fragile. And what's, what's spooky and distressing is that people are feeling that all the way up the ladder. So you have middle class people, you have, you have your Nick Carraways feeling like they're amongst the league of the oppressed, that they're about to lose it all. And when you have so many people feeling so vulnerable, that's a really, really, um, bad set of circumstances for um, thinking about people who are truly poor, who are truly fighting for the next meal and a place to live. It's a really bad set of circumstances for thinking about redistributive justice. And do, and do aspirations, I mean, whether it's sort of uh, the kind of idle aspiration that you indulge if you're looking at things online, or a, a more material kind of aspiration where you actively try to possess or to work towards uh, possessing something. Does that differ from country to country and from community to community, in your opinion? I mean, every community that I work in has their, what Fitzgerald would call their enchanted objects. You know, people want what they want, whether it's, it's a Game Boy or a pair of Nikes. Um, and, and one of the reasons that these enchanted objects become more and more important is because young people don't feel that they really have a chance to get the bigger things. I mean, you don't, you know, kids now are working in slums, aren't thinking that one day they're going to have actual ownership of a house. Um, but, you know, maybe they will have a nice phone. Um, so, so that, I mean, I think that kind of obsessive pursuit of small brand names, and it, you know, um, that becomes the focus. And one of the things that it does in communities is really destructive. Of course, when, when you are an 18 year old and you're, you're, parents can't provide it, you're going to start looking at your parents with skepticism and disrespect. I think if you ask uh, adults in the communities where I work, uh, both in India and the United States, that's, parents are, are, are suffering this a lot. Their children are looking at them fisheye and saying, you know, why should I believe you about anything if you can't provide me this most basic thing? Um, but the other thing that I think is really fascinating and distressing is the way in which the pursuit of some advantage at a moment when there are so few legitimate economic springboards, it turns human relations among people into transactions of, you know, where the essential question is, how can you, how can you profit me? How can you, another human being, help me get to where I want to go when so many forces in the society conspire to keep me from getting there? In, I, I'm thinking about a, a community of college students in, um, Harlow Colony, where you know the girls use the English word for profit. What's the profit talking about to a girl like that? What's the profit? Um, and and you know in those circumstances, this idea of the the beautiful, mutually supportive poor community is exploded. And and the traditional wisdom we've been given by the people who run and and structure this capitalist system uh, all over the world, and and so is, is that. Uh, you know, handing down these, the images of these enchanted objects, whether it's a Nike or whether it's a house, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a way to work up an aspiration. Right, it right? creates striving. But you're right, exactly, striving. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you sort of, you, you work towards it. But clearly that doesn't work in some ways. So I'm just thinking of a, of a, um, a woman who is a member of the Shiv Sena Women's Ring and um, her name is Asha and she was involved in s some corruption that basically, um, took the opportunities of poor children and put them in her pocket. And I you know, asked her one day why, and she said something that I thought was quite profound and quite true. She says, why is it my corruption when the big people say that it's right? And one of the, you know, think about the probably apocryphal lines that, you know, Fitzgerald said, supposedly the rich are different from us, and Hemingway said they have more money. That sort of, in fact, what the rich do has a, has a very direct impact on the way lower income people think that um, 
understand the rules. You think about, I think about in, in my country where you have a president who sees democratic norms as, you know, as bendable as a plastic straw, or who, you know, who, who exemplifies the idea that if you can't win fairly, cheat. Like, ideas like that triple down in poor communities faster than wealth, and believe me, it, those kinds of ideas are being absorbed as we speak. Um, in communities where it's very, very difficult to play by the rules and um, get ahead fairly. Can I just? I mean, I think that's. I think that's all exactly right. And the um, and it does. And as you say, Fitzgerald talks about it as enchanted objects. And again, this was part of the warning. And I was thinking as you guys were talking that it's that I should have mentioned it even in the in the setup of the basic idea of what Gatsby is about. Because in my experience, too often people who read Gatsby and love it or see the film forget the key word that Kate just used, corruption. Gatsby gets where he is through corruption. He gets there through breaking all the laws. He gets there probably through murder, Fitzgerald strongly hints, but he certainly gets there through financial corruption, and he gets there through the equivalent of drug dealing today, which is bootlegging in the 20s. So he's basically a drug dealer who's also involved, who's also kind of shady hedge fund guy at the same time, and he's involved in these financial scams, and that's how he gets there. And so that thing about aspiration that what that so that and that's why the, the ending of Gatsby is so important and so famous because what Fitzgerald basically says is here's a country that could have been anything and Jay Gatsby is this kind of every man person not just an every man American but an every man figure any human being who has all of this potential and this huge imagination and he could be anything and he lives in this corrupt country that teaches him that the only thing he should want is those enchanted objects, that the only thing he should want is material possessions. He should want the big house, and he should want the big car, and he should want the stupid rich girl who is, doesn't care about anybody else and literally kills other people and leaves other people to clean up the mess, and that that's what he should want, and that's what he should, he should tie all of that human potential to those really sordid and shoddy goals, and he's so corrupted by that that it destroys him. And the sense that he is an every man there is really the warning that is embedded in it, is that corruption will destroy humanity, that it will destroy all of us if we don't recognize that we have to hang on to other kinds of value systems. And that is the kind of fundamental story of Gatsby. And, and for me, it always connects back to Trump um, and to the current administration. I, I, at the moment that Trump came on the scene, I said, you know, this guy, if, he, if he's ever read Gatsby, which I doubt very much, um, but if he had or if anybody told him the story of it, you bet that he would see himself as Jay Gatsby. But only in the sense that he's corrupt does he have anything to do with Jay Gatsby, and otherwise he's Tom Buchanan. He is the guy who inherited all of his wealth, who is stupid, who, which Fitzgerald makes very clear that Buchanan is stupid, um, and that his power is inextricable from white supremacy. And Fitzgerald's also very clear about that. Tom is a white supremacist. He is an Aryan nationalist. He believes in what was called Nordicism, and that means Aryan. And that's what he says at the beginning. And Fitzgerald sees very clearly that America's power structures are all bound up in this way, and that corruption is at the heart of it, or carelessness is at the heart of it, this idea that you would leave other people to clean up the messes that you make. And it only matters if you stay in power, and it only matters if you hang on to your money, and the consequences be damned. And that is Trump to a T. And I was really amused during the the campaign, not amused, it was too horrifying to be amusing, but otherwise I might have been amused um, if the consequences had been less, because there were um, a couple of important uh, American columnists, a woman called Maureen Dowd, particularly in the New York Times, wrote that the Clintons were the Buchanans. And I was like, no, the Clintons, if anybody is a Gatsby figure in here, it actually is Bill Clinton, um, the guy who came up from nothing through charm and ability and intelligence and then probably got corrupted. I'm not making actual legal allegations about Bill Clinton, so please don't quote me on that. But for those who think that Bill Clinton was corrupted along the way, then he looks a lot more like a Gatsby figure because these are people who came up from nothing. But our ideas about establishment power have gotten so skewed and about these patrician classes have gotten so skewed that people can't even tell the difference anymore. And I, I was thinking about this as well when I, um, this is the final point I'll make, that um, I watched, finally saw Crazy Rich Asians on the flight over here, um, which I've been dying to see, which is absolutely hilarious. And, and as I was watching it, I do think everything is a Gatsby story, but I was sort of like, you know, there are elements of Gatsby in this too. And, and if it had been the story of, um, I assume most of you have seen it, um, of the heroine, you know, it's a story about, about 
about legitimacy, about um, inherited patrician status, um, about the fact that the American girlfriend isn't good enough because she comes from the wrong background. And then, of course, her friend is the nouveau riche one, and she's the kind of Gatsby figure. Um, and she can't get into the right places. And that, set, and, and that Trump, very, a lot of people think that Trump has been driven through all of this by wanting to be legitimated, and that he still, whatever he does, he can't get legitimated, but that he had all that money, but nobody would give him that kind of credibility. Um, Shunali, I know you actually, I, I, I watched earlier yesterday an extremely interesting conversation you had with Kevin Kwan, who wrote Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and I was, I, I was sort of, since you mentioned the movie, I thought I would uh, very quickly ask you a little bit about what you thought. You know, because when you, when you, either when you see the movie or you read the book, you can't quite tell whether there's an element of satire there or not. You know, and I, and you know, he's not anywhere in the book, I think, is he as blunt or acid as Fitzgerald can be in Gatsby. And I wanted to ask you whether you, you, you perceived the same thing, whether you thought he was sort of just painting a sincere uh, portrait of the new elite or whether there was something more subversive in there. So he's himself the grandson of the biggest banker of Singapore. And he's, uh, Kevin Kwan's grown up with, uh, in this wealth around him, but he was shipped off to uh, the US when he was fairly young to pursue his education. I think when you move away from this extravagance, and of course, his kind of family wealth is all old money. Uh, at least the stuff that's portrayed in the book is definitely old money to a large extent. When you're moved away from the class that you are born into, you develop uh, an outsider perspective while being an insider. And I think that's what's happened with him. And as much as he's a part of it, he's very quietly laughing at it. But he's not judging them. He's laughing at it because he's taking some sort of uh, American outsider liberties, uh, even though he's Chinese, and he's very proud of uh, who he is, uh, Singaporean Chinese. So I got that sense, and I think that it's my understanding that if he had not moved away, uh, he may not have been able to see the humor and the satire and the ridiculousness of it all. And as an Indian, and in India, or anywhere in the world for that matter, now you don't really have to uh, have dinner with the Adanis or the Ambanis to understand the degree of wealth because social media has bridged all those gaps. And, uh, and so to that extent, uh, I understand that it is as true for uh, all, the fa all the things that he's written about are as true for the Chinese because once I read the book, uh, I had met him here at the Lit Fest for the first time three years ago and then I read the book around the same time and then I began to look up Instagram to just see how the wealthy Chinese are doing and it really is all about that. Uh, so it's, it's all very true. But I read something very interesting uh, because we were talking about uh, inequalities and how things are getting a little vulgar. Um, a while back, I read uh, a blog, and uh, there was uh, Matthew Arnold quoted in that, and he said something, and it made me think about India. Uh, it said that inequality, I'm just paraphrasing, inequality materializes the wealthy, vulgarizes the middle class, and brutalizes the poor. So what that's doing is that now the middle class want to be the wealthy, right? The wealthy are going as far as the wealth can take them, perhaps a trip to the moon as well. And the hand that's serving you is feeling shortchanged. And it's feeling it's not being, it's, it's not being served in return. So that is why that brutality is coming in. And, uh, at this very lit fest about two, three years ago, uh, who's a French economist? Uh, Piketty. 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 Piketty said that this, is not a, this kind of capitalism is not sustainable, and he was speaking about India. And he said that in India, the way the wealthy are spending, and really not spending at all towards public welfare and the government in any case, uh, there is so much corruption that today, if any one of us who understands India, and uh, Catherine does too, were to write a check for a charity, would you not think a hundred times before that? When you write something off to the Prime Minister Relief Fund, don't you think 
I don't know which minister is going to take my money away, so let me just get away with paying the least amount or hand delivering it to the poor, actually, which really doesn't happen because a lot of our poverty is hidden away in, in smaller towns and cities. So now that it's all out there in the open because of access via social media, uh, I think now is when it is actually going to get untenable. And it's only a matter of time because the inequities are too vast, the gap is too yawning, and there has to be anger simmering and seething. Uh, you know, people expect honesty from the staff that works in their home when their flower decoration for a party is more than that cook's or the maid's uh, one-year annual salary for a big party. You think they don't realize it? They sign up the bills. And then people say, I want honest stuff. And, you know, I don't want stuff from my house stolen. But that person is angry at you and at the growing inequality and thinking, I couldn't send my kid to school and your one bouquet has cost so much. And, and that's where the caste system becomes tremendously convenient in a society um, by preventing people in low-income communities who are totally screwed over, um, both personal level in their work, they're exploited at their work, they're not paid, they're, they're uh, uh, they're sexually harassed or, or worse, and, but they can't come together as well as they might to fight for their collective interests because they are pitted together as communities. And one of the things that I just want to emphasize is, is how, how instrumental that is for powerful people. That it is, you know, um, and, and, and one of the things that I think is, is, is very interesting in, in, um, is in, 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 in the functionality of the ways that we routinely dismiss and vilify people who have less money. Um, because the more we convince ourselves or each other that people in those communities are of poor character or, um, or have some kind of you know, intellectual lapse, the easier it is for us to continue to do the terrible things that we do to them. And I think that one of the, one of the, for me, one of the most important aspects of my work and spending long periods of time listening to low-income people is to capture and to transmit um, to readers the immense intellectual capacity and philosophic uh, strengths of individuals in, in the most unlikely circumstances. And I think even, even, even my, my, some of my heroes as thinkers, people like Antonio Gramsci, they would argue that, oh, there are no, there are no organic intellectuals amongst the poor. I mean, that, that, that it is a surprise to many people the absolute profundity and complexity that is encountered on a daily basis, um, you know, in slums, in housing projects, in council flats, in, amongst people who live in garbage dumps. That is an absolute failure of uh, journalism and depictions of what's happening in low-income community, and it's, it's absolutely not layers of the capacities of the individuals themselves. And I think that the more that we realize um, the, the, the ferocity of mind that is being squandered in such communities, the, um, you know, and people who have profound ideas about how to make, make the world a fairer, better place, creative, inspiring ideas, the, you know, the more that we understand that, the, the less comfortable we're going to be in um, squashing that potential. I hope. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the point about um, the, the structure of the inequality, the, the fact that it's structural, the sense that people have that no matter how hard they work or how hard they try, um, they're never going to get anywhere and they're not going to get as rich um, as these people unless they cheat, um, and even then maybe not, um, is, uh, as Chanali says, is, is incredibly important and then the rage that that will foster. But I think also, and I'd be interested in whether this happens in India as well, it certainly happens in America, um, the, the way in which the Puritan work ethic is um, internalized and the way that that's used to justify free market capitalism means that the poor are blamed for their, and again, that's what Kate was alluding to, that they're blamed for being poor. And so there's this sense, I mean, literally adding insult to injury, um, saying, you know, it's your fault anyway that you are where you are, and this has nothing to do with a badly structured society or with structural inequalities. And that, and that would only amplify the rage, um, the sense that you know it's not your fault, and you know you don't have a chance. And these people who have every opportunity are telling you that it's your fault. I mean, they're ta literally taking chances away from you. And that is the kind of thing that's going to foment real structural rage. And I was reminded as Shunali was talking, this is a 
um, I thought very funny uh, um, little uh, uh, line on social media that encapsulates all of this. Um, many of you will have seen the slogan for Patek Philippe, you know, the, the very, very expensive luxury watches. They, I don't know how much they cost, like half a million dollars or something, right? I mean, they're obscenely expensive Swiss watches. And they have this ad campaign that they've been running for a couple of years that says, it always shows a father and a son, never a mother and daughter, interestingly, always a father and a son. And it says, you never really own a Patek Philippe. You, mean, you merely looked, look after it for the next generation. Now, first of all, that encapsulates structural inequality, right? The rich will pass on to the rich, and your son, too, will go on to, you know, oppress the poor. Well done. But so on social media, I saw this takeoff on it that said, you never really own a Patek Philippe. You merely look after it until the revolution. <laughs> Fantastic. But that, I mean, that actually brings me to a very interesting point, which is that we, we tend to think that if there's, if there's this kind of sort of sublimated rage and anger, uh, you know, very much as Marx said uh, 150 or 200 years ago, that, you know, it's almost like a sort of dialectical conclusion that at some point this will all end in revolution. This will all end in some kind of um, anger, some kind of uprising. Uh, and yet we don't, we don't see it as often as we... Yes, Kate. But, but that's, that's in part because the nature of work has changed in such a way as it conspires against that revolution. I mean, you think about the United States right now, a full one-third of workers in the United States now participate in the gig economy, and it's not because they get a thrill driving Uber, it's because they have to, because this is what's happened. In, if you look at, um, you know, between 1946 and 1980, the work in America um, allowed you a better way of life. People's incomes and what, what their work bought increased. Now, People are working longer, they're working harder, and more of the wealth of society is consumed by capital. In fact, right now, today, the, the 1%, the only historical analog for what the 1% in the United States um, owns now is 1927, two years after The Great Gatsby was written, uh, which is pretty staggering. But when, and, and it's the same thing in India, in the, the slum where I worked on the six people in 3,000 had permanent work. Well, what does that mean? It means when you were, you know, it's, the factory floor was the place where the unionized factory, where, where people began to come together to have conversations about how to collectively fight for their rights. It's the difference between the mill and the naka. Now, you might not even know your coworker. Um, you don't have those same kinds of relations, and you're working every day at a daily wage to figure out how to feed your family. And that has a profound effect, not just on the nature of communities or the nature of family life, the stability of family life, but on the ability of people to come together and on the nature of democracy itself. If you're scrambling to make a living, how much time and effort and energy are you going to have to invest in figuring out what the roots problems of your society are and how people like yourselves might begin to, to solve them. That's interesting you should say that because, I mean, there's a fundamental conundrum here which, you know, I would like to put to you, which is that uh, if we leave aside imperial and feudal societies, if we look purely at democratic, democratic capitalist societies that result in long and grave periods of inequality, they're almost never sort of book ended at the end by a revolution. And we talked about the Jazz Age and the Gilded Age rather, um, but that didn't end in some sort of big uprising. There was some other sort of resolution that came out of it. So what is it fundamentally about these cities that forestalls what, uh, you know, this kind of uh, rebellion or this kind of upri uprising? I think it has a lot to do with exhaustion, emotional exhaustion and what does it take? I mean, you think about people in communities um, very near here, where how much of your energy every day is going to figuring out just how to get water that's not going to poison your family and that's not going to make you sick so that you, you won't be able to work tomorrow. So when people are spending all their energy just trying to fulfill the basic needs of their lives, um, it turns out that societies have ways of swallowing their deep, grave, unjust internal contradictions for longer than we might think. But I also think that, certainly again, speaking for how it works in America, that the way the American dream is now construed, um, and this, is, um, this goes back to the, um, the Frankfurt School of the 40s, Adorno and Horkheimer said, the American dream is a lottery that everybody plays but nobody wins. But you look at somebody, you look at a family like the, like the Kardashians, 
And they are aspirational in the sense that they look like they won the lottery. And so everybody has that sense as they watch Instagram. I agree that on the one hand, as we've been saying, there's this sense I can never get there and there's this sense of resentment and frustration. But there's also a sense of, oh, if they can do it, I can do it. It, it is just about being beautiful or being an influencer, getting on social media. They didn't do it through any discernible talent or education or anything that might seem unattainable. They just did it by taking pictures of themselves and you know, looking good, and you know, and so, and and they think, you know, well, I can do that, and that's literally what people are modeling themselves on is thinking that's how I can make my way um, to have a position of power and a position of influence. And so there is this sense that the one of the ways that certainly American society has avoided. A, a united rebellion, I mean, there are a couple ways. One is that, that it keeps dangling the hope of prosperity in front of people and saying, you know, wealth will, ha and it shows that it happens to just enough that people keep believing it could be them. Secondly, I think that it puts people in competition against each other. It's not just the exhaustion that Kate's talking about, but what the gig economy extends is this logic that everybody is competing with each other for the prize. So you don't want to get on the same team with those guys because you're fighting them for the prize. Um, and that kind of dog-eat-dog uh, -dog individualism also keeps people from getting together in, in collective action. The other main way that America has done it is with racism. So, um, the, and this is something that the great for example, the great African-American um, historian W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about in 1936. Um, he called it the psychological wage of whiteness. And he said, no matter how poor you are in America, if you're white, you have this psychological wage that tells you at least you're better than black people. And he, and actually Faulkner writes about this as well, um, in, in, particularly in a book called Absalom, Absalom, which is, uh, in my view, his masterpiece which is driven by the entire proposition that if you strip that belief away from poor white people, that's what will drive them to violence. Because that's the one consolation that they have, and that racism literally works as a consolation, and that it worked to deflect socialism, that it worked to divide and conquer the workers. Um, I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so maybe we'll take some questions. There, might, there should be some microphones floating around, but if there aren't, I'll just come out and hand this one over. Hello. Yeah, uh, my question is to anyone who can answer. Uh, India is a very diverse nation and like we have a lot of intermingled problems in general. So as we saw in like France, there has been uh, rise against neoliberalism as such and uh, my question is like why like since the inequalities in France they are not as bad as in America or as in India so how people they got like class conscious like how they founded it they have to revolt against uh, the leaders like why these process of you know fighting against leaders and fighting against the top class it's very difficult in countries like India or, or say even America maybe well I mean just to quickly uh correct that impression. I mean, the protests, I think, were not against neoliberalism in general. They were against a particular kind of tax that was imposed um, because uh, France is trying to sort of strip carbon-heavy fuels off, uh, off its roads uh, and because the president was unwilling or has so far been unwilling to impose a wealth tax. And it's a, it's a very specific kind of neoliberal uh, protest that was happening um, in, in France over the last week. Uh, but yes, I'll, I'll let one of you answer that about sort of why why the anger against uh, an imposed sort of capitalism or neoliberalism in India doesn't quite show. Uh, we talked about the US, why there has been no sort of concerted uprising. Maybe, Kate, you could, you could address that. I just, I just want to say one thing, which is that, that in Europe, in particularly places like France, there's a, there's a completely different expectation of what it is that the government is going to provide its citizens. The, con the history of this social contract is very different. And you think about, um, in the, in the United States, in India, often, often the citizenry is working really hard to avoid contact with government. And, um, and, and in, in uh, Western Europe, places where there's less inequality and more expectation that the government can right the wrongs, you're going to see um, there's going to be more of an incentive to organize and to fight. And, and this case is a good example because it often pays off. I think one important point we haven't really talked about, you know, we had that defrauding of the bank scam, right? 11,000 crores were siphoned out of Punjab National Bank by this jeweler who aspired to be 
uh, on Bond Street and everywhere else. And so when uh, you have somebody who obviously uh, it's crony capitalism, it's defrauding, all of those permissions have been granted, and then a farmer is committing suicide because he couldn't pay off a loan of 30,000 rupees. He's too weak even to go in for an uprising, okay? They are too helpless. They have no food, no clothing, no health care, nothing. And I think France's problems are really different from India's to that extent, so we can't even draw parallels. Uh, any more questions? Um, yes, sir, over here. Uh, I'll just, let's get the mic there. Uh, yes, uh, Sarah mentioned about the uh, very interesting Patek Philip, uh, uh, you know, take on social media that yes, the, you uh, you can you 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 are able to look after it until the revolution comes. So, uh, uh, so my question is to anybody of you who can answer is that is uh, do you ever think that they uh, under the present context under the present circumstances do you ever think that the revolution will happen against? this inequality of wealth or of any other, you know, uh, uh, position that everybody is in? You I make the Vatic prediction. Uh, no, exactly. I mean, I, I would, the, the, as Vatic as I'm going to get is to say that um, as far as I can see, there's much more likely to be a revolution around questions of climate change as such. Um, that's where I see a lot of energy among young people, activists, energy and they're very, very angry indeed. Um, and of course that feeds inequality and of course they're interrelated. But I see that as the organizing principle that is activating the political anger of young people. Um, and that's where I see most of the revolutionary sentiment right now. Um, that said, it's very tied in with um, with, again, uh, young people, both in, Brit in Britain where I live and uh, in America, um, really moving strongly for more socialist models. So how revolutionary that socialism will be, I wouldn't presume to predict, particularly in the volatile political situation that's in the United States right now. I can't predict what's gonna happen tomorrow, let alone when the revolution will come. Um, but I do see those energies fomenting, but we can only hope that they will, it will be a positive revolution and not a violent one. Sorry, just one second. Let's get a mic to uh, other people. Anybody else who had a question? Yeah, over here in the front. Let's just get a mic over here. Hi, this is Kuntal here. So I had a question. So uh, we've been talking about Gats uh, Gatsby. So in the upper house of uh, the parliament in India, we see a lot of rich people going into politics. Uh, so, uh, and in America also, Donald Trump, you know, moved into uh, the White House. Uh, so is, it, is this like detrimental where all these rich people are moving or the, the next step for them is you know politics and uh, they come with a uh, 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 with a goal of doing good for the society but eventually it's not so what is your but, view you on that? You seem to assume that they come with the aim of doing good for <laughs> society. No, no, not That's assume, a bold assumption. Uh, not yeah. assume their their uh, 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 their view is or uh, the way they sell sell themselves is that you know we want to come and we've been seeing that a lot in India recently and now even internationally as well where you know all these rich people are moving into politics so eventually this is detrimental uh, any views on that I think Vijay Malaya is a good example <laughs> he definitely didn't uh, want to join the upper house of parliament for the greater good of Indians uh, but uh, I mean, I think everybody does it for power. And that's why, again, I don't see in India because there's lack of education and uh, politicians are going to play, uh, you know, for votes, for vote banks, play people. I think your Anavadi was a very big vote bank uh, in, in your, the slum that you wrote about, right? And I think that as long as before the election, somebody comes and quickly pays you off and then doesn't improve your fate by getting you taps or water or whatever, you slide back into the old ways. And then whoever is in the House of Parliament is really not going to change your life. That is my cynical point of view. And I would just add, if I may, that um, I've seen this, particularly in, in um, the, the case of Trump, who very clearly did not enter the White House to do anybody good except himself. Um, and I include the members of his immediate family because he only sees them as extensions of himself. Um, 
the, but what I think we need to be careful of is that presumption that people who go into politics do it to do good, which should be the moral basis on, from which we start. It should be the premise. I absolutely agree with you. But what we've seen in the case of Trump, and I've, again, I've seen it in Britain as well as in America, people commenting on Trump, is that presumption is so powerful that, they, that it flips their view of him on its head and they say, well, he must be trying to do some good. There must be, you know, obviously he's here to serve or why would he be doing it? And I'm like, power, money, power, money, power, money, power, money. Can you not see this? It's so self-evident. And so we have to be careful that that moral premise doesn't actually go to whitewash or, to, or distort for us the clarity with which we can see when somebody is just self-evidently corrupt and in it for corruption. We need to abandon that moral premise, at least in the case of that person and recognize that that's why they're there. And even in the case of politicians who go into, uh, wealthy people who go into politics with a sense of noblesse oblige, one of the things you can be quite sure of is that in their, you know, their decisions to um, help people of less means, they're probably not going to do anything that fundamentally uh, weakens or undercuts the privilege of their own class. Yeah, and if anything, a lot of them go into politics to consolidate the wealth Consolidate. that they've already gained, uh, to safeguard it sometimes from the actions of the state. I mean, that's, that's very common here in India as well. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll wrap that up over here. Um, this was a great session. Thank you so much, uh, Shanali, Kate, and Sarah. This was, uh, this was really fantastic. All three writers will be at the bookstore signing copies of their books. Uh, so please give them a big round of applause for an extremely entertaining session. Thanks.